Hi, everyone. I'm Courtney Stone Mierski, co director of events for the Georgetown Law Chapter of the Federalist Society, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's event. First, a word about the Federalist Society. The Federalist Society is a national nonprofit with three guiding principles. First, that the state exists to preserve freedom. Second, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution. And third, that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. Today, we are doubly privileged. First, to have professors Yu and Prakash with us to debate the true extent of executive power, and to have Dean Reuter moderating that debate. Mr. Reuter is the General Counsel, Vice President, and Director of Practice Groups of the Federalist Society, and he'll start us off by introducing our panelists. Thank you so much, Courtney, and uh, my thanks as well to Molly and all the officers of the Georgetown chapter, members of the Georgetown chapter, welcome. Really good to be with you uh, today. This is an ongoing uh, discussion between these two excellent panelists uh, that we've hosted a number of times before. So uh, even the fact that we've done this a few times before, I'm always excited to get back to these topics because they're so, uh, so topical and so timely. Uh, what we're going to do is hear opening remarks from each of our panelists, uh, first from Professor John Yu from Berkeley. He's the author of Defender in Chief. And then we'll get some opening remarks and thoughts from Sai Prakash, professor at UVA, uh, author of The Living Presidency. I've got both of these books. They're both terrific. Uh, I recommend them both highly. They're both available in bookstores near you if you can get to a bookstore in Washington, um, but also online at every outlet you can think of. Uh, ultimately, we'll be looking to questions uh, from you in the audience. We're going to use the Q&A function. I assume everybody knows how that works. So uh, think of those questions. Feel free to, to type them in whenever you'd like. Um, and after our opening remarks and a little back and forth, we'll get to those questions. Uh, but we're going to wrap up after 60 minutes. So without further, Professor John Yu. Thank you. Uh, thanks to the Georgetown Federal Society for inviting us. And uh, thanks to Dean, you know, the the central headquarters mothership has sent the big cheese out to participate in our panel. That's a that's a great, and uh, it's great to be here with Cy. Uh, I just remember, um, I think I was last at the Georgetown Federal Society three years ago when you had the um, student symposium in the first year of the Trump administration, uh, and now we're here having an event what might be the end of the Trump administration, or at least the end of the first term. And it's a good way to, I think, take stock of what's happened. Um, also, I think uh, three years ago, people were still, I think the, were, the student symposium was in March, if I remember, and people were still going, did he really win? <laughs> really, he won? I, people still couldn't believe he'd won. I think there's still people who four year, three years later are still saying, did he really win? I can't believe he won. Um, and three years ago, I would have said uh, I was not a supporter of President Trump's. I was uh, somewhat worried about how he would approach the Constitution because he's a campaigned and came to Washington as a populist, as an outsider who was going to you know, unsettle, overthrow the status quo. And usually the status quo in Washington is represented by the Constitution and the practices and traditions uh, that formed around it. But I think now looking at the end of the first term, uh, we, I think what we see is that it's uh, President Trump's political and even personal disruptiveness have driven his opponents so crazy that they're the ones now contemplating radical constitutional change. And that Trump, for the most part, over the last three and a half years, four years, has actually been left the field to rely on traditional constitutional arguments and the practices of his predecessors. And that, in fact, in the end, and that's why I named the book Defender in Chief, he's become this very unexpected, unlikely defender of just sort of the regular constitutional order, uh, defending it against people uh, who want to radically change it. Well, it'll give you some examples. I, I think one good example is the process we just finished on Monday night with the appointment of Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court. Uh, someone I think Cy and I have both known for over 20 years. We all clerked for the same uh, judge. Uh, President Trump didn't do anything strange or unusual by nominating someone to fill a vacancy, even the vacancy that occurred in his last year. Every president has done so. It's really a question for the Senate to decide, uh, should they move forward to confirm or hold no hearings or even reject Judge Barrett? Uh, every time that uh, the president and Senate were controlled by the same party, all in, I think, except one case, that of Abe Fortas, 
the Senate actually did move ahead to vote on that nominee. And it's only when the parties have been different between the president and Congress, I mean, the Senate, I'm sorry, where uh, people have, uh, a majority have not been voted on or confirmed. Um, so it wasn't any great expansion of presidential power for Trump to nominate Amy Cody Barrett and for the Senate to go ahead and uh, confirm her. In fact, if uh, we'd had what used to be called when I worked in the Senate, the Biden rule, which was the idea you didn't move people forward in the last year of presidency. And even before that, it was called the Thurmond rule. Um, we would have missed out on having, for example, Chief Justice John Marshall on the Supreme Court. He was nominated and confirmed after Thomas Jefferson had won the election of 1800. Or justices like Louis Brandeis or Benjamin Cardozo, commonly, I think, and rightly thought to be some of the greatest judges in American history, also not confirmed in the last year of a presidency. What's the response been? The response hasn't been, oh, if Democrats take the presidency and Senate, they will confirm justices too in the last year. Instead, it's been, let's fundamentally change the nature of the Supreme Court. Let's expand it by two thirds. Let's manipulate the size of the court until it starts reaching the results that the elective branches want, which I think would undermine the rule of law, probably just destroy the notion of federal judicial independence and really change the way our constitutional system works. Even though I would concede and admit right up front that it's Congress's power under the constitution to set the size of the court. There's nothing magic about the number nine, but at the same time, ever since 1869, we've kept the court the same size so that we don't undermine the ability of the courts to be more neutral and impartial and separate from politics. That dynamic has continued across many other issues. It's not Trump, it's his opponents who are now proposing to abolish the electoral college, either through a constitutional amendment or through some kind of compact amongst the states to throw all their electoral votes to the popular winner, which would change the way we picked, have picked presidents for 230 years. Uh, it's not Trump, it's his opponents who are proposing to resuscitate the independent council, make it permanent, and thereby return the idea of using prosecutions and the criminal law to resolve political and policy disputes. You know, it's not Trump, it's his opponents who want to nationalize through this Green New Deal, the entire energy sector, the transportation sector, and housing sectors in our country. If you look at it, it's Trump's opponents who are really demanding fundamental constitutional change. And it's Trump who's been more, I think, in the long lines of defending the regular order, or in fact, trying to return us back to the original 18th century constitution. Uh, because the way he's used the constitution is mostly to defend attacks on his legitimacy. Uh, take uh, the two major constitutional controversies of his presidency, the Russia collusion investigation and the impeachment crisis. In the Russian collusion investigation, he, Trump, fired Jim, Com uh, Jim Comey, the head of the FBI. Under the 18th century constitution, that was fully and well within his powers. The president is the only constitutional officer who is given the responsibility to take care that the laws are faithfully executed. He must have the ability to remove anybody in the executive branch who works on law enforcement because they are all his or her assistants in performing that constitutional duty. He or she needs to be able to remove them in order to direct them. But if you had read the newspapers in Washington where you all are, you would have thought that the president had committed some great sin against the constitutional order by removing someone as professional as Jim Comey, and then to continue fighting against the special counsel, uh, against the gold standard, I think, of federal prosecutors, Bob Mueller. That vision is what I think of as a 20th century progressive constitution the idea of the executive branch is fragmented that policy questions are too important to be left to mere politicians. And so we have to create professional independent experts who will decide questions. And those questions are so important. There's such experts that they have to be kept away from the dirty world of politics. You can see that in the discussion of how great Comey was or how great Mueller was and how offensive it was for Trump to try to control or respond to them. Same thing happened with the other great crisis, impeachment. Again, you have this independent bureaucracy, the Foreign Service, which thinks that it knows how to define what's in the national interest, that it knows how dip diplomacy should be conducted, not the person that the voters actually elected, Donald Trump, who 
yes, unorthodox, <laughs> disruptive in his constitutional views and his foreign policy views and how to conduct diplomacy. But under our original constitution, that is the person who controls foreign policy through the executive power and who we elect and through our election and re-election or not of him place accountability on the exercise of foreign <laughs> policy. Now, I could go on. Cy clearly wants to get in here. He's coughing, coughing. He can't, you know, he, I don't think he has COVID, but I'm glad he's isolated there in his little office in Virginia, safe, keeping him safe from the rest of us. Let me just close by saying, um, to the point where we're saying I disagree is mostly going to be in foreign policy, uh, particularly in war powers. Uh, here, I think the president can conduct hostilities without a declaration of war from Congress. And I think it illustrates what the founders really thought about how the separation of powers would be observed, not through coming in with a laundry list, like we do with Article One for Congress, coming in with a laundry list for Article Two and say, oh, these are the only presidential powers exist and no farther. Instead, I think, A, the founders thought the executive power would be more undefined, that it would have to be able to expand if necessary to confront challenges and emergencies. That's the very nature of the executive power is that it's there because you can't write down antecedent principles and rules to handle things you don't know are coming in the future, to handle new circumstances and new emergencies. And so I think that this is, but it's still originalist in the sense that this is what the founders thought about the executive. And then the second point is the founders thought that rather than subject the executive branch to the same kind of you know, laundry list limitations enforced by courts uh, that we see with the legislative power. If instead they expected the presidency and Congress to constantly fight, they, they expected the limits to be set by that dynamic of the president and Congress continuously struggling. Uh, you know, I remember the, the Federalist Papers talk about ambition must be made to counteract ambition. Uh, by that, they meant that the executive branch and the Congress pursue their self-interest. And by doing so, they would check each other. So when it comes to war powers, the president is the commander in chief. He has at his disposal the large armed forces that Congress has created. But Congress has the funding power and Congress has the power to raise and uh, set the size of the military. It can always check the president if it really wants to by using those powers. So in closing, I would say that instead what you see a lot of complaints and criticisms of President Trump in war or in things like the border wall or in things like the travel ban, Congress has really given the president large amounts of authority. It doesn't want the accountability and responsibility to make these tough decisions. They like to get reelected and then just criticize the executive branch. So what would be better than to let the president use the resources provided by Congress? Don't interfere with them at all. Don't use the constitutional powers readily at hand to stop the agencies or to stop the president. And instead, just sit back and claim everything he's doing is unconstitutional. That's the easiest way to be politically not responsible, but not have to be accountable. And I think that's really what's going on behind a lot of the criticisms that are masquerading as constitutional critiques of President Trump. So uh, thanks very much for bearing with me. I look forward uh, to Sai and to Dean's questions and questions from all of you. Professor Prakash, please go right ahead. You've got 10 minutes to make fun of uh, Professor Yu. Well, it's great to be here with John. Um, John and I clerked for Justice Thomas together and we had great fun and we've been co-authors several times and we agree on a lot um, about President Trump and about executive power, but we, we do have some disagreements. Uh, it's great to be with the folks at Georgetown. Um, you know, I don't know what a Hoya is. Maybe it's a bulldog because it seems to be your mascot, but you know, you had a great basketball team. I don't know if you still do, but that's what I remember, Patrick Ewing uh, and John Thompson. Um, so uh, it's wonderful to be with you folks again. I've been there a couple of times. Uh, I'm sorry that I can't be there in person today. These are the two books, John's book, Defender in Chief. Got the photogenic president there um, for your reading pleasure. And it's about President Trump. And then my book, A Living Presidency, is not about President Trump. It's about what the presidency has become. And I think to have a better sense of what the presidency has become, you need to know what the presidency was at the founding. The, at the founding, the presidency was super powerful, more powerful than any executive at the time. 
had a pardon power that most state executives lacked, could make treaties, most state executives could not, uh, could appoint to uh, all offices, most executives could not, uh, had control over the entire bureaucracy, the executive bureaucracy through the vesting clause could both supervise those officers and fire them, and early presidents did both quite frequently. They were, they were chief executives. Uh, the president had a share in legislation, not only through making recommendations, but by being able to veto legislation. This combination yields a super strong executive, far more powerful than any existed in America at the time. And they knew this, and that's why a lot of people looked at the president and said, this looks like a monarch. But there were limits right, to what the president could do. He could make treaties, but only with the advice and consent of the Senate. It means he had to get two thirds of the Senate to agree, which is rather difficult. Um, he couldn't wage war because to wage war was to declare it. As John said, he and I disagree about this. In the 18th century, the power to wage war um, was subsumed in the power to declare it. And if you started a war, you were said to have declared it. And in fact, most wars were not declared with a piece of paper, they were declared with an invasion or a naval bombardment or firing cannons. And in fact, people at the time said the strongest declaration is the commencement of hostilities. And uh, as the British prime minister said it in the 18th century of late, most wars have been declared from the mouths of cannons and our next door will be declared from a mouth of a cannon. So they had this sort of, <clears throat> non-formalistic view of what a declaration of war is because in the 18th century, most wars weren't declared with pieces of paper. When you grant that authority to Congress and give the president but a check on his exercise, the implication, the negative implication is the president can't declare war on his own. I think John and I agree as to that point. The question is, what does it mean to declare war? And at that point, we disagree. So I told you about treaties. I told you about wars. What about law execution? The president, as you know, has a duty to take care that the laws are faithfully executed. He participates in their making through recommendations and he participates in their making through the presentment clause. <clears throat> but once made, he's got to execute them. Uh, and then finally, the president had this duty to preserve, protect and defend the constitution. He couldn't violate the constitution. He couldn't try to change it through surreptitious means. If we come to our century, uh, these features of the original executive are either shattered or brittle and almost broken. So with respect to war powers, we know that the president, uh, modern presidents wage war without congressional authorization. Korea is the bis biggest example, but the most recent one is of course, Libya, where President Obama took us to war against Libya for months. On end, we fought a war there. <clears throat> no congressional authorization for that, but there's a bunch of other wars, Kosovo and others where we uh, were, were participants, where we bombed or killed uh, the enemy. With, that didn't have congressional authorization. That doesn't describe our war in Iraq. It doesn't describe our war in Afghanistan, right? In those situations, Congress actually authorized the use of military force. What about the treaty power? Again, the treaty power is a shadow of its former self. We don't make treaties anymore pursuant to Article Two. Why? Because there are easier ways of doing so. We've created practical bypasses of the treaties clause, a treaty clause, treaty, treaty clause. What do I mean by that? Well, think of NAFTA, think of the USMCA. These are treaties in the constitutional sense, but they don't receive the Senate's consent, a supermajoritarian consent. Instead, the president just submits them to Congress to be approved through ordinary legislation. Um, <clears throat> this may seem like it has a sort of a democratic stamp on a democratic imprimatur, but the constitution doesn't permit the president to make treaties with the majority vote of both chambers. He's gotta get the vote of two thirds of the Senate. And that threshold was set precisely to protect state rights and make it more difficult to make treaties. When you make it possible for the president to make treaties outside of that process, you are basically uh, violating the rights of the states to be exercised via their senators. And you're certainly violating the rights of the Senate to participate. In this case, the rights of the minority, right? Essentially, a majority of the Senate is willing to run roughshod over the rights of the minority with respect to treaties. And so you don't see any treaties made anymore, or more precisely, you don't see them being made pursuant to Article Two because there's a far easier means of making them. And I should add that presidents sometimes make treaties through sole executive agreements they make agreements that would have been treaties in the past, 
on their own authority. There is some constitutional authority to make international agreements without the participation of the Senate, but they dealt with typically uh, minor and uh, temporary uh, matters and not matters of grand import. The diversion of such matters into the sole executive agreement process is itself another bypass of the treaty clause. The final, two more things I'll mention for what's changed. The president's relationship to law execution is fundamentally different today than it was in the past. Presidents execute most laws without comment or criticism. They don't care about the vast corpus of federal law. But when a federal statute is inconvenient, inconsistent with the president's agenda, or stands in the way of sound policy or a, a deeply felt need, the president will find a way around it. So think of the automobile bailout during the Bush and Obama administration. There was no authorization for an automobile bailout. There was no appropriation for an automobile bailout. They did both because they both thought it was necessary to bail out the automobile companies. Maybe they were right, right? There were a lot of companies that depend upon the automobile companies, right? It's not just the people who work for those companies that depend uh, on them. It's all the part suppliers, mom and pop stores, bars and restaurants that, that serve people in those communities that are also reliant upon GM and Chrysler. So there's a good argument to be made. Libertarians won't like it, but there's an argument to be made that this, this was a good idea, but it was illegal. There was no authorization and no appropriation to do this. And no one thinks as a general matter, the president can just dip into the treasury and do things he thinks are useful or necessary even, but he did it and uh, you know, again, it's illegal. Another example of this is the Obamacare uh, subsidies to insurance companies. The Obamacare Act authorized subsidies, but didn't appropriate. The Obama administration went to Congress and said, give us some money so we can make sure that premiums for Obamacare insurees are low. We can make that possible if we subsidize these insurance companies. The Republicans said, we won't do that. Why? Because we hate your act. Right? That's been the Republican mantra for seven or eight years now, 10 years now. Um, <clears throat> the Obama administration said, well, you know what? We know we went to you for an appropriation, but it turns out we didn't need to because the ACA not only authorizes, it appropriates. This was an uncommonly silly argument. The Obama administration had just gone to Congress to ask for money. To then turn around and say that the statute already granted the money was absurd and a, a federal district court held as much. But this is the sort of thing that happens when a president believes that he just has to be able to do whatever he believes is necessary to shore up his signature piece of legislation. And the final thing I'll mention is the wall. President Trump got a billion and a half dollars for his wall in 2019 when after Nancy Pelosi took over. He wanted more, could not get more in negotiations with Speaker Pelosi. He, uh, his lawyers hit upon the expedient of transferring funds um, <clears throat> uh, after declaring an emergency. So he declares an emergency, uh, transfers funds from the Def Defense Department to the creation of a wall. So there is statutory authority to uh, transfer funds in an emergency, but it's hard to argue that there's really an emergency when you are transferring the funds the very same day that Congress gave you in a billion and a billion and a half dollars instead what it looks like is you just aren't satisfied with the amount, right? There's nothing that happens from the moment he signs the bill to the moment he signs the emergency declaration that suggests there's an emergency. And it's true that the statute doesn't define an emergency, but a beggar's belief to think that this is an emergency. And I think it's a mistake to think that an emergency is whatever presidents say is an emergency. If they don't really believe there's an emergency, they've got a problem. Now, in defense of the president, I will say he's not the only one to have declared a faux emergency. There are dozens of emergencies that we are currently under now. You won't even recognize most of them because they've been around for 20 or 30 years where presidents declare emergencies over and over again to avail themselves of statutory authority. Sorry. And oftentimes these things are totally uncontroversial, so no one cares. This happened to be one of those instances where it wasn't uh, uncontroversial. Um, I think all these faux declarations are problematic. I don't think the president can create a common law of emergency where he expands 
the ordinary meaning of emergency to avail uh, himself of statutory authority. And you can see this across statutes. Sometimes statutes say the president can, uh, you know, do certain things if he thinks it's useful. And other times they say he can do certain things if there's an emergency. And it's a mistake to read these two sets of statutes as if they require the same finding. A finding of necessity or usefulness is different than a finding of emergency. And then the final thing, the final change I'll mention is, you know, the, the president's relationship to constitutional change is far different today than it was at the founding. Presidents, I think, believe, and their lawyers certainly say this, that presidents can change the constitution through practice, right? They can repeatedly do something over and over again. It puts a gloss on the constitution, a gloss on the executive power, gloss on uh, the commander in chief power, and this thereby expands presidential power. Well, this isn't preserving, protecting, and defending the constitution. This is uh, amending the constitution through practice. And it's a revolutionary conception of what presidents can make of their office, because it basically says if you do something over and over again, you have changed the office. And Frankfurter tried to limit this with a bunch of constraints, but no one pays any attention to these constraints, right? So when you, if, you if you've read Youngstown, go back and look at it. He has a bunch of constraints, but in practice, these don't matter in the sense that participants in sort of change in the executive branch don't actually apply those factors. So we've seen these, to my mind, revolutionary changer, changes where fundamental provisions of Article II are, are understood in radically different ways. Why have we come to this point? Let me just mention a few reasons. One is the rise of parties and the rise of presidents as party chieftains. Presidents today can get away with more because they have a party behind them that will support anything the president does in advancement of the party's agenda, right? Almost anything the president does to advance the cause of low taxes, uh, whatever else the Republican party stands for, will be approved by the Republican Party. And the same is going to be true for a Democratic president, be he Obama or be he Biden. If Biden does something to advance abortion rights, it doesn't matter the legality, right? All that matters is, is he's advancing this cherished idea. And Democrats are going to be primed. They're going to be straining to defend this no matter what, right? Uh, because it advances their agenda. Well, when you have this phenomenon of party support without regard to legality in the service of a party agenda, you've entered, you know, you've weakened the separation of powers, right? Because half the country favors this particular innovation and half of Congress favors the innovation. And that weakens the check on the executive. The question isn't what can the presidency do, but the question is, do I like the change? If I like the change, of course, I'm gonna support it. Um, another change that I, you know, I'll mention, I have, Got a bunch of others in the book, but the one other change I'll mention is the rising, the rise of a living constitution, the rise of a theory that the constitution's meaning should change over time without any change in its text, right? The living constitution. You have professors who probably love this idea about how the Commerce Clause's meaning can change over time to, to respond to the reality of the modern economy and modern needs, how rights can change over time to expand in certain areas and contract in other areas. We don't like this contracts clause, let's get rid of it. We like substantive due process, we like the idea of substantive due process, let's let it mushroom to cover all kinds of rights that we love. Well, if you have that conception of rights, the role of the federal judiciary and the role of Congress, of course, the presidency is going to have the same conception of itself. You can't have a living Congress and a living court and a living set of rights without a living presidency. And so I call my book The Living Presidency because I wanted to draw a contrast between Arthur Schlesinger's imperial presidency and the living constitution. Which one is it? Do you favor a changing constitution or do you oppose it? And if you if you favor it elsewhere, how can you oppose it here? What is it about the presidency that renders the founder's vision of it uniquely good in a way that would not be true for Congress or rights? So again, I encourage you to go out and buy these books. Uh, operators are standing by and I anxiously await your wonderful questions. Thanks so much. So thank you both. Um, 
I, I certainly appreciate it. Uh, if you're in the audience, we're using the Q&A function or some people are using the chat function to pose questions and that's just fine. Um, we'll, we'll get to those questions. I, I did have a question I was going to ask and I'm going to combine it with one of the audience member questions and that it really goes to the administrative state. Um, and that is, how has the administrative state, has it enhanced executive power? Is it a net gain for the president? And as, as you think about that, I, I wonder about the sort of de jure versus de facto control that the president gets to exercise over the administrative state. And I'm thinking back to uh, the IRS scandal during the Obama administration when IRS said, well, they're in I think he called the IRS an independent agency, though they're not. Um, uh, and yet, uh, when it came to net neutrality, uh, the FCC chairman Wheeler was headed in this direction and Obama gave a speech, said, no, we ought to go in this direction. And that's where they went. Um, so, so is it a net gain? And to, to make this question more current, uh, Cassie Doolin, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, says, uh, today, Dr. Fauci endorsed a national mask mandate. Would that be an appropriate use of executive power? And furthermore, I'd add to that, can, can the president exercise control over those people? Uh, I'm sure you think, John, they can, they can be fired, but can they be told in advance not to call for a national mandate? Who is this guy, Dr. Fauci? John, you. Uh, so I think that the administrative state is a good example of the political dynamic, like I was mentioning with war, where the president uh, is receiving all these powers from Congress. Congress doesn't want to take responsibility for making the hard choices about how how much air how air should be cleaned or how much clean water there should be. Let's have the executive do it, but at the same time, uh, make it difficult for the president to actually perform those functions by trying to, as you said, as you mentioned, to create agencies where the president can't remove the officials, or um, try to place those commissions more under the thumb of Congress's real political control rather than the president's. So I think the answer to that is uh, the president's removal power. I, I think you know, the constitution, as you just suggested, doesn't actually contain a provision that tell, that gives the president the right to, to, to order subordinate executive branch officials to do anything. So where does it come from? It has to come, I think, from the power to remove. Um, I think this is a problem for Sai's theory in part because Sai is a great champion of the power. I think Sai is probably the leading scholar on how to fire people. You would think he would have Trump on the cover of his book because he and Trump are like that when it comes to firing people. Um, but where's, it, where's that come from in the Constitution? Right? You have to have a vision of a, some kind of unenumerated executive powers in order to even give that power, the power of removal to the president, which is, I think, the only way to control this vast bureaucracy. Because otherwise, Dean, I think you're right, it would be a huge constitutional albatross around the president's neck otherwise, which was you know, until um, you know, Taft's opinion in Myers, although set back in Morrison, the current court seems to be chipping away slowly at Morrison versus Olson. But if Congress could delegate vast authority to the executive branch, but then at the same time, protect all those officials from removal. It would effectively make the president politically responsible for all of these decisions from the administrative state without giving him or her actually the ability to control it. It would be the worst possible situation. It would be ideal for Congress because right? then Congress could influence those agencies, not have to take any political responsibility for their decisions, but still get their way on policy uh, anyway. So I think that the, the key has got to be this power of Removal. It seems strange to many people that all the only the few major Supreme Court cases about presidential power are primarily about firing, but it's because firing is actually the key to controlling the administrative uh, state. And so, and so, I think Trump has actually done very well on this. So Trump has you know fired Jim Comey. I thought was an important initiative. He's you know gone through numerous cabinet officials and White House staff. Um, he's been criticized in the Washington Post recently for trying to extend the right to fire farther down into the civil service. And I think the Washington Post and the civil service, it's a great example of this 20th century progressive constitution. They think they're beyond politics. Uh, I, you know, whether one thinks or agrees with Trump's policies or not, I think it's an entirely healthy thing for the president to try to extend the right to fire deeper and deeper into the bureaucracy. I agree with much of what John says. I guess what I'd say um, is, it's a question of what you mean by enumeration. The constitution doesn't say Congress can regulate navigation. It does say they can regulate commerce. 
And Marshall and Gibbon says navigation is part of commerce. So in a way, it is enumerated, just not in a way that might be obvious to many people. It was obvious to him, and it was obvious to people of that era. He says as much in the opinion. And I'd say the same thing about removal and direction. It's part of the vesting clause. It's part of what it means to have executive power. So it's enumerated in one sense and unenumerated in another. It's not, you know, this isn't some claim that, you know, the president gets penumbral authorities. The claim is that the executive power has a bunch of facets or features, and one of them is the power to direct, one of them is the power to remove. Uh, and that's exactly what, you know, Madison and Hamilton and, and Washington thought. And that's why they, you know, uh, participate in the decision of 1789 the way they did. And that's why Washington fired a bunch of people in his administration, even though there was no specific, I'll say this, there's no specific or, you know, precise language about removal there in the constitution. And even though the statutes didn't authorize it. So John and I agree with about that. The, I think to go to go back to the principal question, what about the administrative state and its effect on presidential power? I think the administrative state is essentially a net plus for presidential power, even though there are these restrictions on removal. I think all these removal restrictions are unconstitutional, but their effect isn't what people suppose. To go back to what Dean was saying, presidents eventually get control of all of the administrative agencies. The restrictions on removal just operate as a lag. They, they, they force a lag. That is to say, you come into office, you might face an independent agency that's 3-2 opposite of your party. But eventually, the one of those three leaves, and then it becomes 3-2 in favor of your party, and your partisans dominate the commission. And so I think Neil Devins has written, this, just, this removal restriction doesn't prevent presidential control. It just staggers it. Instead of having four a synchronous years with the presidency. It's like, you know, the president comes into office in, you know, 2016. By 2017 or 18, he gains gains control of the independent commissions. And that uh, control extends into 20, you know, 2021 or 20, you know, perhaps 2025. But, but, so but, but I'm sorry, sorry, what about the idea of, you know, you have five commissioners, but you've got 25,000 career staff who might be disposed in one direction or another, or you have an agency head with 25 politicals and 50,000 employees. Does, does, does the president really exercise control in those circumstances? Well, I, 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 agree, I agree with the thrust of your question, Dean. To the extent that there are people below the heads of these departments or the heads of these commissions who are making decisions that the president believes he can't fire or bypass, that is a problem. Um, but, you know, I, I kind of have John's view. The president should be pushing the matter and not accepting the conventional wisdom that all these people are untouchable. They certainly get demoted and they certainly get pushed around in the sense they get pushed to other positions, right? There were several people who participated in the impeachment process. Put it that way, they can, you know, they, I think they complained that they were demoted, they were retaliated against, but that's, I think that's perfectly appropriate. Um, so I, I do agree that there is this sort of, you know, there is this sort of deep state that principally thwarts the actions of Republicans because the state tends to be uh, more progressive in its nature. And I think the pres presidents ought to push back on that. The, the problem is presidents have limited attention spans. They can't monitor every bureaucrat and figure out whether they're doing something wrong. It's really more of a function for the department heads to do that. But my, my point is, yeah, these things are totally unconstitutional, but they're a net gain because the president gets all this legislative power, right? That the president through his appointees to the FCC decides about spectrum rights. The president through his appointees to other agencies that issue regulations essentially gets to control all kinds of things. And so, you know, OIRA is reviewing all these regulations from the executive branch agencies. And I think as you suggest, there is some coordination between the so-called independent agencies and the White House. Going back as far as Clinton, you know, there was, there was a claim that, you know, Al Gore Al Gore's man was the chair of the FCC and they totally coordinated everything. And I think that's true that I think it was Reed Hunt. I think he was a former Al Gore aide who was the chairman of the FCC. So these, these agencies aren't as independent as we're told they are. They're not really using any expertise of the sort that they, ha that they have that's unique to them. They're political appointees, right? The heads of these agencies are not 
you know, Einsteins. They're, they're smart people. They're, they're smart people, just like all the people on this call, right? They don't have any particular expertise that couldn't be uh, found in anyone else appointed to head these agencies, whether they're answerable to the president or not. Okay, an audience question. Could Congress actively pass legislation, uh, through legislation, a prohibition on the use of force in a particular area abroad? For example, could Congress write a law saying the president cannot use force in Yemen under any circumstance? Uh, and a sub part of that question is, can, can Congress take nuclear weapons off the, off the table completely or under certain circumstances? I, I don't think so. I think Sai must uh, agree with those. I don't. Uh, I think Congress can effectively achieve that end uh, as it had at the end of Vietnam, where Congress just said no funds can, can be used for military conflict in Southeast Asia. Congress brought the War of 1848 to an end by forbidding any further funding uh, for U.S. military forces in Mexico. Congress knows how to end wars if it wants to. If it wanted to end deployments in Iraq and Syria and Afghanistan, it could bring them to a halt within days. All they got to do is cut funds off. Um, I think, however, what the founders did not want is Congress interfering with the president's decisions on what are the right moves to protect the national security. So I don't think Congress can decide on weapons that can be used or not used. Congress doesn't have to build the weapon systems, but once it decides to build them, they've already made their choice. I don't think Congress in World War II could have passed a law saying you shall attack Japan first and not invade France, occupied France. I think those are all within the commander chief power. Why then does it uh, Congress suddenly, because of the Declare War Clause, have the right to decide when that force has to be used in the first place? I think the constitutional text leads otherwise. If you look at Article 1, Section 10, it says, uh, no state shall, without the consent of Congress, engage in war. And then it says, unless actually invaded or threatened with attack. If the founders really had in mind this idea that declare war is not a legal, legal term, but in fact, this colloquial term about starting hostilities, why didn't they just copy that language? Uh, they didn't. They chose declare war. I think that was because Congress is in control of the legal consequences of hostilities, but they weren't given the sole control to decide when to start the hostilities. So I disagree with my good friend, John. I think that John wants to say that the check on war making uh, is fiscal. The, the Congress cannot provide the war, the, the army, the Congress cannot provide the, the weapons, uh, or Congress can cut off the money for an ongoing war. But what they can't do is say you can't use force in a particular arena. And apparently he thinks they can't say that after the war has started. And I'm, it's a little curious to me because if you can say that you can't expend money for the war, why can't you say you can't expend money in Yemen? And if you can say you can't expend money in Yemen, why can't you say something that's essentially the functional equivalent, which is you can't wage war in Yemen. I don't know what it is about using, tying it to funds that makes it fundamentally different. Um, and if we go back in our nation's history, you know, look up the quasi war when you have a chance, look at the statutes that Congress packed, passed rather. They are very specific about who you could attack and where you could attack them. And they were signed by John Adams uh, they were signed at a time where George Washington was still alive. George Washington was actually made commander in chief of the, of, of the army by John Adams. No one at the time says these statutes are unconstitutional, but under John's view, they have to be because A, Congress can't tell John Adams he can't attack France. B, he can't tell, they can't tell him that he can only attack France in, in particular ways. So these statutes, I think, are inconsistent with the notion that the president has a free hand in terms of fighting a war because they're doing the exact opposite. What, what about that, John? Uh, I mean, can, can, can Congress say, you can use air, air, air attacks or missile attacks, no boots on the ground? No, I, I think those, uh, I think laws that do try to interfere with the choice of strategy or tactics are unconstitutional. I think con even if you were to set aside the debate of the declare war clause, I still think they're unconstitutional. And I don't think Sai's right to say that, um, well, anything you can do with the funding power, therefore you must be able to pass a sort of prohibitive or affirmative statute about it. Um, I think the spending power is, a, is just different, just like other powers in the constitution are different. They don't, don't have to work in parallel with each other. 
And so the thing about the funding power is that it's a perfect check on executive power. So yeah, if, if Dean of Uri, if, if the Congress doesn't want to fund uh, intervention in Yemen, all they have to do is nothing. You know, the funding power to be used effectively is just don't pass any funding. You know, so whenever Congress is passing these funding bills, it's already affirmatively making these choices. If they want to stop any war, any tactic, just don't give the Defense Department any money at all. Or they can just choose to give it to the things they agree with. It's a very easy power to use rather than actually, and this is why it's different than a prohibitory statute, rather than having to affirmatively pass a statute, get it over the president's veto saying, do not wage war in Yemen. The funding bar is actually much broader and more easy and easier to use. You agree with that, Professor Prakash? I think, look, John's absolutely right that the funding power exists as a check on the uh, waging of war, and John's right about how Congress has used it. John, I think, reads our Constitution as the British system, right? That the president, what I'd say is he thinks the president can start a war, and then the check is, is the parliamentary check on the fisc. And I think that is a check that's implicit in the Constitution. And we kind of know this because we look at Article one, and it says, you know, no army appropriation beyond two years. And that's precisely because they don't want Congress to pass a permanent appropriation for the army, thereby, you know, giving a blank check to the executive. But I don't think it follows that that's the only check. Um, and then in terms of there's a, there's a political question, there's a political dimension, uh, Dean, which is, you know, how easy is it for Congress to stop a war? And I think the answer is, it's easy in theory, difficult in fact. Right. So Congress passed the, you know, repealed the Gulf of Tonkin resolution before they cut off funds. And it took a while to get around to cutting off funds uh, for that war. And whenever they talk about cutting off funds, people are able to say, my gosh, you're going to leave our troops defense, defenseless in the field. And so it, one way to think about this is it's is it easier to, you know, uh, take back the keys or is it easier not to give the keys in the first instance? And if you give someone the car keys, it's much harder to have them to get them back home than it is to keep them at home if you never gave them the keys. So I agree with what John said as a matter of theory. I think he's right, um, but I don't think it's the only check on executive warming. John, do you want to respond to that or should we head in a different direction? Look, I think, um the way size reading the constitution, which is consistent way with the critics of the Vietnam War uh, read the constitution, I think they make this uh, mistake about how war powers are supposed to work or national security powers in general, which is this idea that um, the big problem is to prevent the president from waging wars when he shouldn't, that the, the chances of mistake are higher when you when the president can go first. He's going to make an affirmative error. There's another kind of mistake that the founders worried about, which is the problem of not acting, failing to wage war when you should have. Um, that's a problem we've had uh, a much greater form in the 20th century, in the 21st century than we did in the 18th century. But this was very much on the minds of the founders. If you read the Federalist Papers, they are constantly worried about the instability of North America, the many security threats on the borders. We're just accustomed to living today in a world where we have no serious threats on our borders or in the continent. But if you read the founders, they're very aware that they are a very small nation on the Eastern seaboard surrounded by the British and the French and the Spanish. And they talk about how the constitution has to be designed to enable quicker, faster action. The Hamilton describes the executive power as a power to act with energy and speed and decisiveness. Uh, I don't think they would have wanted to design a system that is so biased in favor of inactivity where there's so many checks on the ability of the country to take on a national security threat of the kind I think that size describing and then the Vietnam War critics described. Let's pivot a little bit. Uh, Sticking with an audience question here, what are your views on the constitutionality of potential future legislation by Congress to pack the courts? Obviously, the regulation, of course, falls within Congress's enumerated powers, but there isn't a, a viable argument that such power to regulate courts is not absolute. Uh, accordingly, where Congress's underlying purpose is not to regulate the courts so as to promote the functioning of the judiciary, but to affect individual outcomes of cases, before the court, such would such legislation violate separation of powers principles? Does, do Congress's motives matter here in packing the court? 
So I, why don't you, I already have oh, my I, say. I, I mean, I think this is, a, this is a great question. I think John and I are both of the view that Congress can expand the size of the Supreme Court uh, and shrink the size of the Supreme Court. In terms of the motives, it's a curious question because I don't think that is gonna matter. Um, let's suppose the president appoints someone because he or she thinks that they're gonna preserve Roe versus Wade or overturn Roe versus Wade. I don't think that the president has done something wrong. I don't think the person so appointed has done anything wrong. So, I mean, we might think that it's wrong to do this constitution. I mean, sorry, we might think it's wrong in some sort of moral sense, but I don't think that it's a violation of separation of powers for members of Congress to have the wrong motive in packing the court. So I think it's constitutional pack the court. And then I'd say, I think it's a bad idea because you're, it's not a stable outcome. You cannot expect to pack the court and not expect the response, right? Of course, the other side's gonna pack the court as soon as they have a chance. That's what we've seen in states where states have packed the court. There's a cycle of packing that eventually fizzles out because both sides see that it's not gonna get them any permanent advantage and then they give up the tool. So if they wanna pack the courts, they'll get a temporary benefit and then it'll be you know, eliminated through uh, another packing of the court. And I'd say the, you know, the one, con the, the best way to pack the court is to win elections, right? If they win the election, if Biden wins and then Harris wins and then whoever else wins, Bernie Sanders when he's 100, they're gonna have all the justices, right? And so they'll have packed the court in the way that the constitution sort of makes it crystal clear is totally legitimate and in a way that's consistent with the past practices of the last hundred years. And just I want to just add one thing about the packing of the court is uh, I agree with Sai about what's going to happen is once you pack the court, it's going to create this escalatory spiral where each side is just going to keep adding judges whenever they get in power. It just seems to me that um, the Democratic Party used to be, which is proposing this right now, I might add, these were all ideas uh, that uh, people who used to be opposed to Roe versus Wade and busing used to think of. If you remember, if you just don't remember far back, but you know, if you look at Robert Bork's book before he passed away, Slouching to Gomorrah, right? He has all of these in there because he's upset about the court for deciding Roe versus Wade, right? So this is it is uh, interesting to me how the the polarity of support for these the switch now from the far right to the left. The Democratic Party used to be the one that thought of the role of the courts in the sort of Caroline Products footnote four idea of protecting discrete and insular minorities from the majority. Uh, if you go ahead and start this spiral that size, uh, I think, rightly worried about, you will remove the only institution left that's going to be there to protect minority rights. Now, right now, a lot of my liberal friends, they don't like the idea that the court's protecting the rights of religious minorities. But that's not the only thing that's going to change if the courts just become this kind of adjunct to the administrative state. It just every four years, you just change all the people or you just make it bigger and bigger. So it does what you want. Who's going to stand up for rights of free speech after that or the rights of criminal defendants after that? Nobody. I, I, I find I think that the uh, like the Democratic friends in their short term um, unhappiness with Trump. Again, this is a theme of my book, are considering longer term constitutional changes, which would do a lot of harm to our constitutional system and seem to me contradictory about the of the principles that the Democratic Party says it stands for. On the other hand, I want to say that if the court gets really big, me and Sai are available to serve. <laughs> <laughs> so I do have some self-interest here. Yeah, let, let's. We have five minutes left, but we've got a question from Molly uh, Hogan, um, which I'll summarize here. Do, do any um, areas of Biden's platform, uh, candidate Biden's platform, strike you as uh, executive overreach, a right for overreach claims? And and does it and does President Trump's exercise or perceived exercise of, of executive power matter as as people analyze that going forward? Sign, I have a disagreement about this, but I would, I believe the platform calls, and I saw, I thought I saw uh, Vice President Biden say that he was going to bring back the DACA and DAPA programs. I don't think he realizes that they're still in existence <laughs> and that the court enjoined President Trump's efforts to overrule, right, to terminate them. Um, I do think uh, it is an unconstitutional executive power to say, basically, I don't like the immigration laws. 
I'm not going to apply them to 8 million cases. Uh, I do think there's a prosecutorial discretion where the executive gets to choose where to put resources, but I don't think he can basically say that law, the resources are going to be zero, not because they're difficult cases or the return to the national interest is too low, but just I disagree with the policy that Congress has set. I think that does go too far. To, to Molly, to, you know, John's right about our disagreement about DACA and DAPA, although I think I think DAPA is still enjoined by a federal court order that was never lifted. It was like some district court somewhere enjoined it. And it stood because I think the, I thought because the court split 4-4, four, four, but put that aside. I don't know what Biden's platform is. Like I, the, he's not running on a platform, right? He's just running on, I'm not Trump. So I can't speak to what his platform is. And you could imagine that it's just whatever the, you know, the, the left of the democratic party wants, but uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm not sure I can really comment on that about the Republicans being compromised because they didn't stand up to president Trump. What I'd say, Molly is every party doesn't stand up to their own president. And if them, if Democrats could try to stand up to Trump, even though they were supine before Obama, Republicans, you can rest assured, will try to stand up to Biden, even if they were uh, puppy dogs for this president. So, you know, there's no consistency on this question of executive power. Uh, you become an executive power hawk when you're out of power. Uh, you That is to say, you like hawkishly watch the executive and complain all the time. And you're a dove when you are partisans in power. So this won't stop them from, you know, squawking and they'll have success, uh, turn, you know, based in part on what the public thinks about the overreach, but also what their base thinks about the overreach, right? I mean, the best thing that can happen to the Republican Party in Congress is Biden wins because we're probably going to have a flip in the House, or, you know, upon that happening. That's what's happened every, you know, the past several presidencies, right? The, uh, Obama takes over, the Republicans have this thumping victory across the whole nation, and Trump takes over, and the Republicans lose control of the House and almost lose control of the Senate. Very good. Well, we're just about out of time. Let me uh, let me just make one more endorsement of these two fine books, Defender in Chief by John Yu and The Living Presidency by Sai Prakash. I recommend them both strongly. Um, with that, I will turn things back over to Courtney to wrap up. Courtney. All right, well, thank you all for coming. That was really informative. Learned a lot about executive power that they didn't teach in Con Law 1. Um, so really, really enlightening, thank you. Um, and we are really happy we got our chance to host you today. So thanks again for coming to Georgetown and I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thank, thank you all. Thanks, thanks so much, everybody. guys.